Welcome, and uh, thank you for uh, accepting this videoed version of my uh, presentation for the Committee on the Present Danger of China, Washington, D.C., July 19th, 2019. Um, I'm going to say hello to Steve and, and, uh, and Brian and Frank, and, and thanks to everyone for listening. I'm here to talk to you about the strategic importance of Hong Kong and not necessarily the uh, geographical strategic importance, but very specifically the financial importance of Hong Kong uh, as it relates to China and as it relates to both the U.S. and Great Britain. For those of you that uh, are probably well aware uh, due to the most uh, recent media attention, uh, uh, Hong Kong has a number of uh, uh, MFN or free trade agreements uh, with both uh, Europe, Great Britain, and the U.S., and those agreements are governed by uh, uh, documents that were signed back in, in Great Britain's case in 1984 in the, uh, the Sino-British uh, Joint Declaration of 1984 signed by Thatcher and, and Deng Xiaoping at the time. Uh, and in the U.S., uh, our, our agreement is governed by the, the U.S.-Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992. Both of those agreements uh, stipulate that uh, Hong Kong must maintain its autonomy, even though uh, we had this agreement uh, to, or Great Britain signed this agreement to hand Hong Kong back to the Chinese uh, effectively in 1997, uh, the Chinese agreed to a 50-year a uh, kind of hands-off policy from a perspective of uh, the judiciary, uh, the economy, uh, as well as the, the legislative system. And so both of these agreements again, uh, governed by this, this idea of autonomy. So China's run this system with Hong Kong that's basically one country, two systems, i.e. Uh, it's a special administrative region of China. However, Hong Kong has been technically governing itself uh, and has economic independence from China as well as judicial, and, uh, as judicial and independence and legislative independence. So what's been happening recently and uh, what has really transpired since February of this year is uh, the fact that, that uh, uh, China has pushed through Carrie Lam and her administration's government uh, an extradition bill. The extradition bill uh, was, is and was something that has been on the forefront of the seven and a half million people that live in Hong Kong. That bill basically uh, makes it, uh, uh, it skips the judicial uh, oversight process of the Hong Kong judiciary and allows China to effectively uh, uh, deport uh, um, anyone that, that, uh, that, uh, that China deems to be a criminal. And uh, China's uh, uh, allegations or accusations of, of, the, of the criminality of a particular uh, person either traveling through or being a citizen of Hong Kong that can then be uh, uh, um, uh, sent to China uh, without any kind of judicial process other than a rubber stamp from Hong Kong. Why is that important? Uh, to us uh, in the West, and, I, and, and the importance is, is vital to that of really China's lifeline, and China's lifeline is U.S. dollars, and, and I'd like to go into just a brief overview of, of why it's so important to China. Uh, China runs two systems itself. It runs two currency systems, essentially, that of dollars and that of, of its own domestic currency, the, the uh, renminbi or the yuan. And, uh, it can, it, China in its own economy runs, uh, they, control the, uh, they control the narrative, they control the printing press, they control uh, uh, just about everything, the police, and they control uh, um, how their economy runs internally, and they can, again, print as much money as they need to. What China's real problem is, as they interface with the rest of the world, nobody will accept RMB as payment for any of, any of the goods that, uh, that China wants to transact, uh, either goods or services internationally. And so China's FX reserve pile is that uh, made mostly of dollars, euros, yen, and pounds, or let's call it global currencies. But really, for their all intents and purposes, let's say it's dollars. And that FX reserve pile is what China uses, again, to interface with the world. China is desperately short natural resources. They're short food. They're desperately short energy. They're short all kinds of things, base metals, uh, that it takes to uh, uh, generate the GDP that China generates uh, uh, internally. And so it must have an ever-growing pile of dollars if it's going to have an ever-growing GDP. Uh, and so where the, where the syntax comes in is the fact that China's dollar pile has been 
uh, depreciating. And it's been uh, being sucked out because they run huge twin deficits now. Well, they run a, a deficit, a uh, fiscal deficit of, of north of 10% of its GDP, one of the largest in the world. And now they're starting to run a current account deficit on an, on an ongoing basis going forward. We believe, uh, I believe that you're going to see a persistent current account deficit from now on, on an annualized basis in China. And what that means is their dollar pile will continue to shrink. So they must source capital from the rest of the world, from somewhere, from someone. The MSCI inclusion for their equity and, and bond indices is a much needed infusion of capital into China. But one of the other avenues of capital and where the Chinese, the wealthy Chinese, hide a lot of their assets is in Hong Kong. And this, this Hong Kong capital flow, uh, really from south to north, uh, is vitally important to Chinese companies, as seen for the, in uh, Alibaba's proposed uh, secondary listing of a $20 billion deal uh, uh, that, that is really right around the corner. And more importantly, they raise roughly uh, $40 billion a year. So far, they've, uh, they've raised about uh, um, half of that in about 200 deals in Hong Kong. It is the place in which China Inc. raises dollars. They raise both equity and, and debt dollars. So with China's overreach and with their uh, breaching of the agreement, which China does with just about every agreement they sign, uh, they're breaching the 1984 joint declaration with the British and they're breaching the 1992 Hong Kong U.S. Policy Act by uh, essentially overreaching with their, uh, uh, in the judiciary. Uh, and why, why that's so important to us as, as a country, again, is China has that, or Hong Kong has that uh, special uh, trade status where they don't, they don't, uh, they're not uh, uh, burdened by any of the tariffs that the U.S. is imposing on China, and they have a free trade agreement with with the U.K. The mechanics of that deal are very important to understand today, and the mechanics are so that you have the British have a twice a year uh, uh, a review of the sufficient autonomy of Hong Kong, and that goes. Those, those reviews are, are, are delivered to Parliament twice a year in the U.S. It's a once-a-year review that the State Department sends to POTUS. And POTUS, in his sole authority, as per the agreement, uh, decides whether or not Hong Kong is, quote, sufficiently autonomous to maintain uh, its MFN or its trade agreement with the U.S. So what you've seen recently is uh, with China's overreach and pushing through the extradition bill, uh, you saw bipartisan support to try to preempt the president and basically take this decision out of his hands. You saw Nancy Pelosi, Marco Rubio, Menendez, and you saw a number of uh, uh, the people on both sides of the aisle in the U.S., which when was the last time we saw Pelosi and Rubio work together on something? Uh, they immediately convened together and launched potential legislation to preempt President Trump and take that decision out of his hands and decide that Congress, in its sole right, might execute, or sorry, might determine whether or not Hong Kong is sufficiently autonomous. Now, that is vitally important to understanding. If we remove that, that designation from Hong Kong and Hong Kong is burdened by the tariffs that China is, is burdened by, and essentially we start treating Hong Kong as China, it's so important for Hong Kong because Hong Kong's trade represents more than 350% of its GDP, and it runs a very small surplus today. What, it is vitally important to Hong Kong to maintain that MFN status and also not to be treated uh, as China. And so what I urge everyone in the room to think about is whether or not today is Hong Kong sufficiently autonomous? Does it run its own judiciary, its own legislature, and does it run its own um, economy. Many people would think, including myself, that they're not sufficiently autonomous the way it stands today. China's Supreme Court is the court uh, of, of the land in Hong Kong. Uh, mutual legal participation between Hong Kong and China uh, is basically run by China. The CEO of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, is chosen by China. So what is likely to happen going forward is I think it's, again, vitally important for the U.S and our lawmakers and our uh, uh, State Department and, our, and PROTUS to realize that Hong Kong isn't sufficiently autonomous. Hong Kong is in real trouble. In 2047, or whether that should be discounted back to the next year or two, we're going to see China probably uh, remove Carrie Lam 
and install a pro-Beijing hardliner and push this extradition bill through. Even though they said it's dead, they have legally not withdrawn uh, this potential legislation, i.e. that means they only have, tw they have a 12-day window from when they could revive the legislation, put it to a vote, and get the pro-Beijingers to vote this through. Hong Kong is at the crossroads today of the capital uh, flow into China. We have to stop the capital flow into China if we as a country want to start to win the economic war with China. I think that's something that Frank, something that uh, uh, everyone there, uh, Frank, Steve, uh, and all of you understand, we are fighting four wars with China. We're fighting, uh, so far, sorry, we're not fighting a kinetic war, but we are fighting an economic war, a cyber war, and an information narrative war. I think it's very important for us to fight the war with China by getting the upper hand on, on their economy, and as they exercise their communistic control over what used to be uh, a free and democratic country is of vital importance to the U.S. Uh, national security. And I think it's important for us to uh, pay particular attention to that and support members of Congress in both the Senate and the House to maybe take that decision out of the President's hands and put it in Congress's hands in case these, uh, uh, this, this incredible overreach by China continues. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you for listening. And uh, I look forward to our next Committee on the Present Danger meeting uh, in the future.